It's been two and a half months since Russia invaded Ukraine. Talks haven't produced much as Russia steps up its military campaign, especially in the east. Some neighboring countries now fear possible Russian aggression against them. And others are concerned about the economic consequences of the war. NATO's presence in Lithuania has increased to around 3,000 soldiers. But Lithuania has joined other Baltic states in asking for more NATO forces. So is a Russian attack against other states imminent? And what will it take to guarantee security in the region? Well, Germany was planning to increase its Russian natural gas imports through undersea pipelines, Lithuania had one goal, to break free. And it succeeded. In fact, Lithuania was the first EU country to cut completely from Russian gas. So how did they prepare the nation to survive without Russian energy, the biggest supplier in Europe? We'll put that to the Lithuanian president, Gitanas Nosjeda, talks to Al Jazeera. Lithuanian president Gitanas Nosjeda, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. It's a pleasure for me. In the early morning of February 24, when Russia invaded Ukraine, what was your first thought? It starts again. Uh, probably was the first thought because just yesterday, on the 23rd, we returned from Ukraine, where they were with the President Andrzej Duda, uh, visiting uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. And you know, you know, this feeling of war was already in the air. And we so no surprise from your side? There was no surprise. Of course, there was a small hope that maybe we will avoid this worst uh, scenario, but probably it was too naive to expect that this concentration of Russian military forces around uh, Ukraine is for nothing. Of course, there was a plan to just to implement this terrible idea to invade Ukraine and to try to occupy the whole country. Who was and the first person of NATO you called? And what did you ask for? It's a very good question. I think we communica communicated so much uh, this first week uh, with all the leaders. And I think the next day we uh, visited Brussels. We met uh, uh, on the European Union level, European Council. And I remember the speech of Volodymyr Zelensky on VGC. And you know, his expression was like this. Uh, colleagues, maybe we talk for the last time. Maybe uh, everything might happen in my country, especially in the first days. The feeling was like this. But also in your country, right? You also... My country is always under Russian pressure and probably we, we, we used to live with such the situation and, you know, we are well prepared or with, at least we try to prepare ourselves for uh, any kind of uh, aggression. This is not uh, only a military aggression we are facing or the threat we are facing, but uh, energy blackmailing. Uh, economic pressure and all these uh, last 20 years we felt this pressure and we tried to do our best in order to be ready to take such challenges. But the very first day that Russia invaded Ukraine, did you think he's coming for Lithuania as well? I think if Putin will be successful, he will come uh, after us, and this is not only uh, the talk about Lithuania. This is the next target might be Moldova, Romania, other Baltic countries, Poland. Uh, yes, the, fight, the appetite uh, of this empire is just without any limits. The deputy uh, uh, foreign minister of Poland told, uh, talked to Al Jazeera in this show earlier that he thinks that certainly Putin is aiming also for Poland. Do you really think that he also wants to aim for Lithuania? Yes, I think. I think this is possible and only one 
scenario we could avoid uh, Putin's aggressions, aggression against our countries is successful war, successful for Ukrainians war in Ukraine. If stop, uh, Putin will be uh, uh, stopped there, yes, it will be probably the end of his era and uh, probably will mean some relief for democratic countries in, in Europe. As a country who uh, was formerly part of the Soviet Union, do you feel that people, countries in Europe, for example Germany and other countries, underestimated the risks of Russia and Vladimir Putin? I don't think that the word underestimated is correct one. I think it was the just the feeling that Putin is better than we uh, expect. And there was the illusion that we have to do business with uh, Kremlin's regime no matter what is going on. And only this war in Ukraine opened the eyes, opened the, the eyes entirely. And I think it was a game changer, changer in this regard. And now I do not see any leader in the European Union, maybe except one or two, who still thinks that uh, for the war in Ukraine, Ukraine is responsible, uh, or both countries are responsible. I think uh, every country in the European Union understands the true nature of this regime, and uh, the content of this uh, regime is just to be aggressive and to try to swallow neighboring countries. But was it a mistake of the countries in Europe who had a different approach and were engaging with, with Vladimir Putin and Russia for a long time? And what have been the consequences, if you would call it a mistake? You know, uh, I don't know whether uh, illusions are mistakes. Sometimes we want to have some illusions, yes? Uh, as a persons, as a countries, as a politicians. Fortunately, it was not the case in my country. Nobody has any illusions about the uh, true intentions of Kremlin's regime. So this is the reason why we did our homework. We tried to prepare for possible uh, such scenarios like we are witnessing now. And this was the reason why we were first to say, we are ready to cut off all the energy ties with Russia. It's a surprise because Lithuania, 30 years uh, ago, was probably most reliant on, on Russian energy resources. Yeah, but a quarter of your no gas. illusions, we uh, implemented and we created all necessary infrastructure just one day to say nothing. Uh, this is the end and we will not uh, just finance uh, from our pocket the uh, war in Ukraine. This is our moral duty and we are ready to, to uh, fulfill it. But a quarter of your gas was coming from Russia, right? I think two billion uh, tons a year you need and a quarter came from Russia. How are you now uh, making the gas demand? Uh, we can cover uh, all our demand uh, through the Klaipeda LNG terminal. It was established in 2014. We can satisfy our needs uh, for crude oil through Butinges terminal. It was uh, built in 1999, so 23 years ago. And uh, the largest oil refinery in Lithuania, uh, in Majeike, uh, belongs to Pekin Orlen, Polish company. And this company said, uh, even before the war, that they will not buy uh, Russian oil anymore. Although it created some technological problems, problems for this company because they need so-called Ural type of oil. But they were ready to solve this. But and where is your gas now coming from? And because now, you will now need our to buy gas is coming from uh, Norway, from United States, and we created all necessary infrastructure, deepened our ports to accommodate uh, the uh, ships from Qatar. So we have the agreement with Qatar Gas and the Qatar uh, Gas will be provided to our LNG terminal too. And it plans to buy gas from Iran, for example? 
so far there are no discussions about uh, the gas from Iran, but we, first of all, we would like to buy the gas from the countries who has, uh, which have uh, certain principles, values we share. You were in uh, Borodyanka in Ukraine on April 14, just after uh, a lot of destruction happened there, a lot of people died. You compared the situation to it's worse than the Nazis. It was quite a statement. Uh, of course, because during the World War II, uh, around 60 million people died. Why did you say that? You know, we uh, are able to see these pictures coming. And some, one thing is to see the picture, another thing is just to experience it. And it was terrible uh, finding how cruel are these atrocities committed by Russian regime there. To see destroyed uh, houses, to see the parts of people in the streets. And you know, this, is, this, is, this experience was just shocking. And of course, my statement was very natural because I just said what I thought. You would and still say it like this? Yes, absolutely. I uh, think that those atrocities are uh, terrible, not imaginable in 21st century. And those war crimes are not committing themselves. They are not fulfilling uh, themselves because somebody is responsible for, for this. Regime, people, institutions, and even this idea of just to restore the uh, former Soviet empire, this is probably the very beginning of those atrocities because the people cannot understand that every country, every nation in Europe, and not only Europe in the world, has the right to determine or to, 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 to uh, create uh, its uh, fate and to choose the way they want to go. Talking about restoring the Soviet Union, we're now two and a half months into the war. Are you now less concerned that there might be an invasion from Russia into Lithuania than two and a half months ago? Or can we say that looking at how the war is developing, that the pace of the Russian invasion is not as we might have thought you in know, the beginning? You know, the formula is very simple. If Putin will succeed in Ukraine, nobody can feel safe. And the targets might be very different, and the targets might be even few of them at the same time. Not only one country, one target, but many targets. If he will be stopped there, Probably it will be end of this affair, and as I mentioned, it is very important for the stability of the whole region. One of the weakest points of NATO is considered to be in your country, the Suwalki Gap. Uh, it's uh, the uh, gap, a piece of land between the Russian uh, exclave Kaliningrad and Belarus, which is backed by Russia. There have been suggestions on state TV in Russia that Russian troops should occupy that piece of land, which would basically mean that the Baltic states are cut off from NATO. How worried are you about that piece of land at the moment? Yes, we feel like the, you know, we feel sandwiched between uh, heavily militarized uh, Kaliningrad region. We see a lot of uh, Russian troops there. We see military equipment, even tactical uh, nuclear weapons are there. You, you, sh you know yes, that for we, sure? Yes, I think already several years uh, Russians brought their uh, nuclear ta tactical weapons. Which is missiles. right next door to Lithuania. Yes, uh, not only Lithuania, but I would say a Baltic region uh, too. And on the other hand, we see Belarus, which is a country, independent country that does not exist anymore. After the elections in 2020, just Lukashenko and, and, and his government less, uh, left uh, or uh, just uh, uh, do not have any signs of independence and they are just but the province of Russian Federation. So what does it mean militarily? It means that uh, Russian military forces can use uh, Bel uh, Belarusian soil 
as a platform for, to attack neighboring countries, what they are actually doing right now from the uh, Belarus. Uh, so the same is also applicable for Lithuania, Poland and other countries of the region. So we do not have any time to react because uh, military calculation changed dramatically and this is the reason why we are saying look, the situation changed uh, very uh, evidently and we have to react. Instead of talking all the time about uh, deterrence, we have to talk about forward defense in this part of eastern flank of NATO. Well, for the deterrence, you only had like a couple of thousands of NATO troops in Lithuania until now. That's, of course, not going to be enough, right, if there's an invasion. It's basically only meant to slow down any any attack. What do you need from NATO to protect your country and to protect yes. the Baltics? We need more uh, troops, as you rightly mentioned, uh, those several thousand uh, soldiers are not enough because the Russian capacities uh, outpace our capacities by several times. Uh, we need also military equipment and I would say the kind of equipment which allows us to switch from the air policing regime to air defense regime. And of course, this is very ambitious task to create air defense systems here in the Baltic regions. The region, and this is uh, probably one of the priorities, at least I believe that this is one of the priorities of the, of the NATO as an organization. And they hope very much that we will bring forward this agenda uh, and this topic uh, in the coming uh, NATO summit uh, taking place in Madrid in June. Can you be more specific? How many troops are you asking for and what kind of military equipment? We are talking, and this is not only our uh, discussion, internal discussion, but this is also discussion on the NATO level, to turn uh, battle groups into brigade. So for Lithuania it, me it would mean the brigade uh, would you ask me, if you would ask me about our possibility to accommodate uh, these troops? Yes, we are working on it and we uh, already mean thousands decided... thousands of troops here, right? Maybe it up would to 8, mean a uh, uh, much uh, higher number of uh, troops, but we are already building the necessary camps. We uh, also have the special law on uh, new training area in Rudninka, which is, by the way, closely to the Suwalki Gap. And all these infrastructure elements are needed in order to be ready to accommodate a much uh, larger amount of military equipment and uh, to have additional military uh, troops here in Lithuania. This is the responsibility, first of all, uh, by um, Germany, because this country is leading EFP presence here in Lithuania. But we are talking with American troops to, too, because uh, our strongest ally within NATO is United States. As you, as you know, United States have also some military uh, troops here. But there was always a reason why there were not many NATO troops here in the Baltics, in Lithuania, because it was always a very sensitive balance between deterrence and not posing a threat to Russia, because Russia feels NATO is coming too close to its borders. Vladimir Putin has said it many times. Isn't this increasing the risk? If you have more NATO troops here on your territory, would that not increase your risk instead of decreasing? Uh, yes, Russians are using this rhetoric in order to scare us and to probably to intimidate uh, just in order to stop uh, increasing military equipment here in the eastern region, eastern flank of NATO. But I uh, don't think we should follow this kind of, of uh, manipulation and disinformation because, as I mentioned, uh, military troops or military equipment in Kaliningrad outpaces our uh, capabilities uh, by several times. So uh, before the war in Ukraine, there was a consideration, and more, maybe it was correct, that it is possible to reinforce in case, in case of emergency, in case of possible military intervention, 
we can bring additional forces and uh, which will be able to defend uh, together with our national forces our territory. But uh, having in mind those strategic changes, as I described in Belarus, in, in Kaliningrad, I think we don't have uh, time to reinforce, and this is a, a reason why we are asking for boots on the ground. But it's against the founding act between Russia and NATO from 1997, which said that there shouldn't be too many NATO forces close to the Russian border and also not too close. Are you not uh, violating this founding act? We are not violating this because as a, this is a responsi responsibility of both sides. And uh, one country does, does not have any right to increase the capabilities, to, to intimidate and to attack uh, neighboring countries, and to require and to ask the other side uh, to do nothing or to just to passively uh, watch what is happening. Uh, I think uh, we should understand that ambitions to restore the empire are still there. Ukrainians are fighting very hard, fighting with this kind of ambitions. They are doing very well. They are fighting a heroic uh, fight battle with uh, this big country called Russia. And I think the fate of Ukraine and the fate of Europe will be solved there in the battlefields in Ukraine. I don't know if you heard, but Vladimir Putin told this story about a trapped rat, that he, was, he had this experience in his youth when he was cornering a rat and the rat attacked him. Basically, he is, he's using this analogy, of course, to show that you know, he, Russia could be feeling like that, feeling trapped. Are you worried that it could escalate or that even nuclear weapons could be used? Uh, yes, we cannot ignore uh, or, or uh, exclude any possibilities. Uh, I, I still believe that, that maybe there is some sort of rational thinking, if uh, you would allow me to express it like this way, although I see that what is happening now is, is, is just very difficult to explain by uh, rationally. So there is no evidence. They are, there is no one practical example which shows that NATO as an organization is aggressive. And we have a lot of evidence that Russia is doing this. Uh, just starting for, from the wars in Chechnya uh, first, then the second, then uh, uh, Georgia 2008, then Crimea and, and uh, Donetsk Luhansk uh, frozen conflicts in 2014, Transnistria in Moldova. We have a lot of practical evidence which shows that you cannot believe, you cannot trust this regime but because that, this that is even regime. confirms my question about the threat that it could escalate into an even bigger war and even a nuclear war. Uh, but you know, if we will do nothing, it will be direct invitation for Putin to proceed. Finally, I want to ask you because you've been asking about a no-fly zone from NATO. You have also asked Germany directly to send Leopard tanks to uh, Ukraine. None of it has happened. How much support do you feel from NATO in case you are, your country is going to be in trouble? If you already see the divisions within NATO, also within the EU, if you look at the gas, Germany is still buying gas from, uh, from Russia. We so wouldn't be so pessimistic. It's not a united front against Russia. Are you, fr are you frustrated need... or disappointed? I am not frustrated. I understand that we have 20, 27 uh, countries uh, of European Union on the table, and they have not only different opinions, but they have different situation. And uh, I am really... Uh, optimistic because I uh, can follow these changes of attitude, changes of opinion, because I can witness that some of my colleagues three, four years, uh, not three, four years, but three, four months ago, we are talking about possible engagement of Russia into different fields. 
Ma why do not see and do not hear the, any talks about engagement of Russia anymore? That's and an end. Many of them There's are an end delivering. to diplomacy. There will no diplomacy, possibility for diplomacy you know, uh, I, As I mentioned, the fate of Ukraine will be solved not in the cabinets. It will be solved in the battlefields. Unfortunately, unfortunately this is the case. But uh, looking uh, at my partners in European Union, I, 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 will, I should say that the big revolution in mines already happened. Uh, we uh, have woken uh, up, and I think this is most important looking forward. President Gitanas Nosiera from Lithuania, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you very much.